I've figured out how to be effective in my day, and that's if I could teach things to entrepreneurs. I mean, that's kind of the most important thing. It's not about to-do lists. It's not about goals. It's about a goal, uh, one thing. You can't you can't be pulled in different directions. And when you work day in and day out only towards one thing, not three things, not four things, one thing. How fast you move towards that one goal? I mean, you you'll go light years. So we're here today with my friend Stephen Mayer, aka Agent Stephen. Um, I'm really I'm starting to bother myself by studying like this. I feel like it's too it's too European. I feel like this is too. I'm not. Offended. Is this a normal? That that I'm offended. This is you're offended. Yeah. What's the way like What's the way a man sits? Do I have to sit more wide like this? What's the? I don't know. You're tucking your foot. I don't know how to do that. I'm just. Anyway, hanging out. Thank you for coming in, man. I appreciate we're you. We're, we're taking over. This is the Agent Stephen podcast. Yeah, today. do it, do it. Uh, so <laughs> I'm lucky enough to have Stephen in studio. He's always traveling around and moving. He lives in Orange County. We're in Los Angeles. So, well, is that part of LA County? Orange? No, no, it's Orange County, yeah. obviously. But um, but so, but he's always traveling. So we're happy to have him here. Um, thank you for being here. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. So so I want to talk to Stephen because I, I first met Stephen, we, we first met in Las Vegas, right? Vegas, yeah. This is a few months ago. This is in June or July. And we were meeting with a bunch of other guys from Instagram. And then uh, we got rained out. Remember the flight got rained out? Yeah, there was thunderstorms yeah. and rains. Yeah. Which is pretty unusual for, for the area. Very unusual. Yeah, and so all the planes were down. And all of us who, who had flown in, there are people from Australia and people from all over the world who'd come to meet yeah. for this Instagram, basically a dinner. Yeah, you know? we, had, we had like an influencers meeting. Yeah, an influencers meeting. Um, and so so everyone was going home and we got rained out. And so uh, Stephen, uh, myself, and our other friend Nathan were, were rained out. And we're like, we have to go back to LA. What do we do? So we rented a car and we drove from Vegas to... Eight and a half hours. Eight and a half hours. And, that, and there, were like, there was like wildfires on the yeah. side of the street. So you get to know someone in eight and a half yeah. hours of traffic. Yeah. And I, w <laughs> and I wish that we'd recorded that conversation because then I just say, fuck the studio time. I just want to record that. <laughs> that was a great conversation. That was good. That yeah. was a really good conversation. Um, and and uh, not, not bullshitting you because you're a trillionaire, but, um, but it really changed my life. Like it was a really good conversation. Good. That's awesome. Um, yeah. And so. My, mine too. I mean, you know, for me, I'm a little bit older. So. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you have the gray, the salt and pepper. Yeah. I got the salt and pepper going on on my goatee. But, uh, you know, just being older and, and uh, you know, I feed off of uh, young talent yeah. and just, you know, the way you guys think and, and where you think the world is headed. And that's why I do so many entrepreneur events. You know, like I was at USC last night. Yeah. Tonight I'm at UCLA and, you know, judging uh, different uh, startups and, and their pitches. That makes sense, though, because um, and this is kind of a weird thing, but I feel like in terms of social media, you're one of the older guys. In social media, and You're not that old. So right. that's the thing, but you know, like the, the, the amount of influence that you have in this space is kind of unusual for someone like who's late thirties, early forties, right? You know, late thirties, bro. Okay. Late thirties, <laughs> 34, 39, <laughs> 39. I'm not 40 yet, man. Right. Come on. Don't push okay, me okay. over the edge. Well, well next year, but see what I'm saying? It's a little bit right. unusual. It um, is. No, I, I know my, my following is probably a little bit older demographic as well, because uh, I feel like if you're a kid who hasn't done it or doesn't want to do it or hasn't accomplished something, my advice probably doesn't make sense to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, yeah. you know, my advice comes more towards the people that are trying to take their life to the next level that have actually most likely achieved some level of success. Yeah. And and for me, that was my biggest struggle. You know, okay, like I'm here, but I'm still running around like a hamster. How do I take it, you know, how do I get out of the rat race? Yeah, it's uh, it's less, like, it's, it's inspirational, motivational, that's cool, but, like, you actually give specific advice situational strategical tactical like right. do this think like this um can you give us some background on how you got started in business who you are it's just for, people don't know you you know yeah so today my name is steve Mayer. my instagram is agent steven and uh i'm ceo of a media company in orange county and essentially what we do is handle uh, marketing budgets anything from facebook adwords digital advertising all the way up to you know, traditional advertising like TV, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll produce them, we'll, you know, we'll shoot it, uh, we'll do the media buys. And, you know, my, you know, my smaller clients spend, you know, a few hundred grand a year with me, my larger clients spend, you know, five to $10 million a year with me. And basically, you know, my job is to handle their branding and their entire marketing budget. So I got a staff of 50 and that's essentially what we do. Um, beyond that, I currently also serve as chairman of the law office of Jacoby and Myers, which is uh, one of the largest, if you grew up in Southern California, you know who they are. It's a nationwide firm and uh, 
one of the largest, oldest consumer law firms in the country. And uh, essentially, I am responsible for strategic planning, budgeting, uh, more back office operations. I don't do any, I haven't practiced as a lawyer in a long time. And I'm also a startup investor, real estate investor, and I teach a lot about entrepreneurism and, and you know, just kind of how to start a business, how to scale a business, how to take the business to the next level. And it didn't start out like that. I started out, you know, my first business was selling shoelaces at age 11. Come on, that sounds like such a bullshit no, story. No, really, I swear That's to God. like, you know, I walked uphill both ways. No, listen, shoelaces, shoelaces. with sports teams on it. <laughs> I had all the NFL teams and all the major league baseball teams. At the time, for some reason, you know, I didn't have a lot of NBA shoelaces, okay. but you know, and uh, and basically I'd sell them for a dollar a pair, and uh, <laughs> you know, and I was the guy You're that dating yourself right now. <laughs> listen, I was I was the guy I know, but I was the guy that like from age eleven I always had twenty bucks in my pocket. Yeah, it yeah, didn't yeah, matter yeah, just because yeah. I was always selling something. Yeah. <laughs> I knew you know my parents provided a decent life for us, but I also knew that the stuff I wanted they couldn't buy me. <laughs> yeah. So I was always trying to figure out you know how do I make a dollar. Yeah, and at age sixteen. I returned some Christmas presents and I got some Christmas money together. It was like 90 bucks. You returned Christmas presents? I did in order to get some money because Ruthless. I had a wholesale catalog I'd come across and it had these pile six by nine speakers <laughs> in the box <laughs> and I bought them for 90 bucks and uh, sold them, took them to school. Within a week, I'd sold them to some rich kids for 150 bucks <laughs> and I'm like, you know, I could do this. So then I bought a boom box for 150 bucks, sold that for 200 bucks and next thing you know, I was... 10th grade, I was selling five, 10 grand a month worth of electronics equipment to the kids at school. So I went from one school to the next school, and next thing you know, you're getting hooked up. So all the kids in high school started buying stuff from me. And from there, I, I got a pager, and I started taking out $13 <laughs> classified ads in the recycler. And I, literally at lunchtime, I would go to the payphone, and I would call people back, schedule times to meet them after school. It was like, it looked totally shady, because right, this high school kid you know, <laughs> calling you back from a payphone, and I'm like, meet me at the local like <laughs> silo or Circuit City. And, I, and you know, I jump out of the stuff with my car and yeah. like, sell it to them. But, um, so that kept going. And when I graduated <laughs> high school, you know, at that time, I had about $20,000 worth of inventory in my parents' garage. And they couldn't park their cars in the garage. And I had gotten into USC. You know, I wasn't a really good student. I actually got kicked out of one school, went to another school. And, um, you know, by you know sheer luck, I got into USC. And I said, I don't want to go. And, you know, coming from an immigrant family, that's not okay. Yeah. You know, they were like, yeah. what? You know, what Persian, do you don't right? want to go. Yeah, I'm Persian. Yeah. So, you know, when they, you know, when my parents came here, and to this day, they don't have the mastery of the language. We don't have the support system. So in their mind, you get an education, and it solves all those problems. Yeah. And I didn't want to go the educational route. I wanted to open a business. I wanted to keep doing what I was doing. So I had a dream that, look, I could open a small retail store selling, you know, what started out as speakers and then consumer electronics and everything else. And I could kind of, you know, build the kind of life I want to build, which is to be able to afford stuff that my parents weren't going to buy for me. Yeah. You know, I was, you know, I grew up reading the Rob report, dreaming every day, dreaming every day in class. Like I, w I want all this stuff. Why yeah. can't I have it? So, uh, I had to move out essentially. So I moved out, uh, I think within a week of graduating high school and I opened a small shop. It was 900 square feet. It was brick a and mortar. Yeah. Brick and mortar. And this is before this is pre-internet. Yeah. So this yeah. is in 94. Um, that's when I graduated high school and, uh, eBay hadn't even come out yet. So I was actually an early adapter on eBay um, in 96. But uh, so this is like AOL days, dial up, you know. Remember so. when you used to get those CDs in the mail for like the free AOL trials? Absolutely. And you get like yeah. two weeks and you could keep switching out the CDs to keep like getting yeah, the free. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> yeah. It's great. So uh, so I, I struck a deal with my dad because I, no one would give me a lease and you needed to have credit. And yeah, I couldn't, yeah, yeah. you know, I could afford based on what I was selling the, I think it was $850 a month rent, but I couldn't. I didn't have credit. So, you know, who, who's going to give some 18 year old kid, you know, I credit for a lease. Right. Yeah. So my dad said, look, I'll sign the lease. You go to school. I don't care how you do it. Night, uh, weekends, whatever you go to school. And that was what kind of dragged me back into education. So I went to like community college and I went to night school. I went to night law school eventually got my law degree, but still the shop lawyer, though. had the shop worked seven days a week for seven years, like a slave, literally. I mean, it was horrible. Like, you know, you, initially I would sell, I had no staff, so I would sell a bunch of equipment. I'd go install it in the car. I'd tell the, the, the client, Hey, why don't you go for a walk? I'd literally lock the front of the shop, go in the back, do the install, um, and just slowly grew it. And eventually it turned into, you know, my goal was to have a chain of audio stores. It, it did turn into like two stores. I started a wholesale warehouse, 
But the first time I went on the internet and one of my friends were like, check this out. And he goes in a chat room and he's talking to somebody in Florida. And I'm like, man, like my dream was to have like a circuit city type chain of stores. And that just blew my mind. And I'm like, you know, I got to figure this thing out. Because if you could talk to someone in Florida, you're eventually going to be able to sell to someone in Florida. Yeah, yeah. So became an early adapter on the on the internet and, uh, you know, created like a buy.com type of a, a business and uh, eventually sold them all off. I sold them in the early 2000s. It made me a, you know, multimillionaire. And uh, at the same time, I was graduating law school and I was dabbling in real estate and different businesses. Wait, how many stores did you sell off? You had two, two. Two stores. And I had a wholesale warehouse and the internet company at that point. Ah, right. Okay, so they were selling okay. consumer electronics. I mean, at one point I was selling everything from guitars to drum, bongo drums. I mean, just everything, anything audio related, you know, from speakers to, you know, amplifiers, equalizers. I mean, uh, anything that had a plug and that would sell. Yeah. Anything that would plug in the wall, I pretty much was selling it. That, that's so a, short of computers. That, well, yeah. That's, so anything that's kind of a different like niche a little bit. Right. But that's, that's an interesting starting point because a lot of people want to know even just how to get to that first breaking point. You, since you've progressed since then, it's very easy to say, yeah, I became a multimillionaire and I moved on. But like, that's an interesting. No, I mean, it was not, it was a very life. long struggle and you it know? was, it wasn't easy. Yeah. You said seven years, right? Seven years of working seven days a week. Right. And then after that, I went to six days a week. So it wasn't much of a break. Not much of a vacation. Right. And on Friday nights, because I was always so exhausted from working, you know, and I was going to school at night. So my friends are out partying, getting laid. And, you know, what am I doing? I'm either sleeping or getting caught up on classwork because I was sleeping through class because I was so tired. So, you know, that sacrifice, I mean, everybody talks about sacrifice, but people just don't do it, man. I yeah. just don't see people doing that It's trendy to talk about it, though. It's like really, it's like it's like a like a trendy in thing right now. Talk yeah. about like hustle in. And we're, people know. hear it. They're like, oh, that's cool. That's cool. Well, shit. Did you ever do it? Yeah, yeah, like, you, you got to do it. That's not... how you get to that point. You know, you got to do it. And so for me whatever my dreams were at the time. And at the time they weren't very sophisticated at the time. It was, I want a particular lifestyle and I want money and I want to live well. And, uh, and I put that above having, you know, stable girlfriends, seeing my friends, seeing my family. So everybody, my time was very limited because of between the school and, uh, work. And essentially that's where, you know, all my life went into for a really long time. Now I'm lucky I did it in my twenties because you know no. it, it would be much more difficult when you have kids and a family and everything else but you know regardless of where you're at in life you need to go through a particular stage of struggle i wasn't smart enough to do it in five years yeah. but i think that the minimum is five and i think realistically for most people it's eight to ten years and when i look at i'm on my fourth career now and pretty much all my careers where i've made a lot of money selling off a business i was in a particular uh niche for like eight years so, I mean, 18 to 26, like I was you're, doing it electronics. Like you're old enough to be in multiple businesses for eight years. It doesn't seem like you're old enough to do that. So, really, from 16 to 26, yeah, okay. I was in electronics and real estate. I started, I bought my first house at 21. I mean, right now I have a large portfolio of commercial and residential properties. Um, but, uh, you know, and then from 26 to 33, I was in law or 32. I was in law, started a law firm, scaled it up, sold it for many, many millions of dollars. Um, bought and sold a bunch of law firms while I was doing that in the middle where I saw opportunities. And uh, and then I got into the advertising media space, which is essentially what I do right now. And, uh, you know, I'm on my third career. I'm not even 40 yet. There's still so. time to become a surgeon. <laughs> <There's laughs> yeah. still, right, listen, I, you know, I am willing to do whatever. And that's the thing. And I'm curious and I'm always willing to learn. And I really don't look at myself. It doesn't matter what industry you're in. I'm truly a student of business. And that's the way I look at it. So it doesn't matter if you're a doctor, you're a lawyer, you're a nothing. It doesn't matter. You know, it just doesn't matter what you are. As long as you focus on the business aspect, that's where you're going to make money. And that's where you're going to make enough money to be able to impact lives. So people, you know, people always say, oh, you know, it's so shallow. You focus on making money. And yeah. I'm like, you know how many lives I impact? You know, my, you know what my goal is for this Thanksgiving? To feed 10,000 families. How many people will you come across in your life that could feed 10,000 people one yeah. night? Yeah. Okay. So that's only done th through putting yourself first and saying, I am good enough. I believe in myself. I can achieve my goals. And you go after it and you make decisions that are consistent with that. And then the type of person you are comes out, right? So if you're just a greedy bastard, you're already then you don't do dick, those things. So what difference asshole, does it make? Yeah. More, more money is just making you yeah. bigger. And, and if you're the type of person that, that gives back and, you know, growing up, I actually wanted to be a missionary, believe it or not. So if you're the type of person that, that <laughs> enjoys giving back, you're going to have tools to give back in ways that the normal person can't do anything. So instead of aspiring to live a life of 
community service and whatever you want to do, why don't you live a life of getting yourself ahead in life and yeah. then seeing how many people you yeah. can pull up with you? That's so interesting because I hear a lot of people say, well, you know, if you really want to help people do social work, I'm like, how can you do, how can you help? You can't help anybody more doing than social you work. Can, you, you fucking can't even keep your lights on. Why don't you get yourself ahead yeah. and you can open up your own orphanages? Yeah. And that's real social work. Right, right. You but they, they see things like they, there's this whole like cultural archetype of like the Ebenezer Scrooge where if I have a lot of money, then I'm greedy and I don't give it. That's it's bullshit. That's bullshit. It's bullshit. The only thing I'm greedy with is my time. Yeah. Because my time is valuable. Thank you so much for being here. No, 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 no. I'm just saying, oh, no, like from a perspective, I'm not I greedy. Know, know. You know, some people are greedy, I guess, with their money. You know, for me, I think. You know, for certain people that like when you achieve a level of success, you're being drawn in a lot of different directions. Right. And I got a wife and kids too. And I make a lot of my decisions not based on money, based on freedom. And I think that's one of the things we talked about yeah. when we were in that eight and a half hour drive. <laughs> yeah. So what really drives me today is is having the ability to be free from most people's normal constraints. Like I don't, you know, we, you text me an hour and a half ago. Yeah. And I'm here. Yeah. yeah. And it took me an can hour and a half here? to get here. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so it's one of those things that in order to be able to, I can like get up and leave and do what I want when I want. And whatever I do, I make sure that those businesses and those ventures play into that. Now, that doesn't mean at some points in my life or my month that a project comes up and I need to dedicate, you know, whatever, 80 hours straight to it. And then, but once that's out of the way, I've structured my life in a way that um, I have that freedom. And to me, having success and having money, that's what it equates to. I wanna live life on my terms, and my terms right now are, actually, I got off the phone with my wife this morning, we're gonna go into New York on Friday, coming back Wednesday with the kids. Nice. And we're gonna, you know, and that, to me, that that's the greatest gift, and that's the greatest part of being successful. So, sometimes you take, sometimes if you've done that, if you lived like that for long enough, you take for granted the fact that, that it's, that, it, that you have that flexibility because it seems normal, right? But not everyone has that flexibility. You know, I have friends that, you know, one, they have, you know, I have a lot of friends that have a lot more money than me, but they lose sight of why they did it. Right. So um, I go to like, you know, sometimes I go to these events and I'm in Europe and I'm talking to people and, and they're just like, you know, it took us and I have friends that are billionaires and they're like, you know, it took us to get to our 60s to figure out what you've kind of figured out. And I'm not you know, bragging about myself, but for me, you know, my perspective really is about, you know, being able to control your time. And to me, that's more important than money. Can I make a lot more money if I work like an animal still? Yes, absolutely. But I think at some point you need to turn that switch off and say, look, now it's about designing the type of life I want to live. And how do I do that? So my decision making, you know, in my mind, everything I do kind of plays into that. Yeah, I mean, I think I think like you're saying with the sacrifice, you go for a period of years where it has to be about the money, but you build that Absolutely. momentum so that you can have the decision making power later. Yes. to do that. That's exactly. You know? um, but there are a lot of people who skipped the 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 hustle phase and are like, I just want to design my life right now. No, you can't do it. But and I talked <laughs> to a lot of friends like this who are like, how do I, you know, how do I get to the point where I can have more freedom? How do I make more money? I'm like, well, you, why aren't you? What are you doing right now? Like, yeah. you know, you're 22 or something. You know, figure some shit out. Yeah. Um, now is not the time to be lifestyle designing when you need to be Absolutely. hustling. So there's and still, and when I say I have a lot of free time, that doesn't mean I still wake up every morning like I'm dead broke. Yeah. So I mean, let me let me let me clarify a little bit. Putting that on I, I open my eyes yeah. and I'm like, boom, I'm out of bed and yeah. I am moving. What time you wake up? I'm usually between 5:45 and 6:15. It's pretty good. So yeah, it used to be a little bit earlier before, and and now it's kind of sometimes it's 5:30, sometimes it's usually not later than 6:30. Are you getting good sleep? Are you getting like eight, the eight hours, or you just don't care? Um, I sleep at usually 1130 and I, in or in let's say 11, somewhere around 11 ish. And then, you know, if I'm waking up at 530, I, I need six and a half hours. Okay. So I'm a six and a half hour kind of guy. That's pretty good. I wish I could be four. I'm not that Me guy. Me too. And I wish I could some days be eight, but I'm not that guy either. I'm just six and a half is where my body works. Yeah. And, and I feel unproductive if I sleep in more than what my body needs. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, I get up like I'm broke. I'm usually in the office early. Um, and I, you know, and I, and the thing is, if you're good at what you do, it's almost like the gamification of business. I don't know uh, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, okay. So I've gamified how to be effective with my day. So, so walk so, us through your day. What does a typical day look like? Um, well, a couple of days a week I do mixed martial arts. Right. So those days are a little bit different. So I'm going to keep those days out of the mix and that's usually two to three days a week. Um, on those days I'll get up and I train. So, uh, usually from like seven forty-five to nine and then my day starts a little bit later, but on non workout days, days yeah. whatever you want to call it, uh, I get up early. I usually, um, 
open my phone. My first app is Bloomberg. Uh, on the toilet or in the bed? No, in the bed. Okay. So just what's going on in the world. Okay. And I think uh, being a successful person, you kind of have to have your pulse on the world, world, but you can't look at it from a micro perspective, more of a macro perspective, but just kind of know what's going on. Like, did the sky fall while I was asleep or yeah. not? Everything right? looks good. All right. Yeah, everything's fine. Okay. The world's okay. Yeah. And then I think, what's the number one thing I need to get done today? And actually, my feet don't touch the floor until I figure that out. Uh, so I think to myself, if, you know, because, you know, the day before you go on vacation, you just miraculously get such amazing <laughs> amount of work done. Yeah. So I think yeah. about that in the morning. Yeah. I'm like, if I go into the office and I leave at noon, which I usually do, what's, what's, that, uh, what's that most important thing that I need to push forward in my life, whether it's personal, professional? And a lot of times it could be multiple things, but it's one thing maybe for each business. Right, right. So right. for this part, for this business, I need to move the ball forward here. For my personal life, I got to do this. For another business, I got to do that. So when I get up, I get up and I act with intention and I act with purpose. And that's kind of the secret. So I know what I'm doing. I've already, I have a roadmap. There's Most a people get behind. on a hamster pole. There's yeah. a reason behind why I get out of bed. Or else why the fuck would you get out of bed? Excuse my French. I'll do it. Why would you get out of bed? It makes no fucking sense to me. So when I get up, I know what I'm doing. So I get up, I take a shower. I usually have a shot of espresso uh, with some Italian cream and, um, and my ass is in the car by 7.40. I'm at work usually at 8 o'clock and I know exactly what I get done before I get to emails, before I listen to my voicemails on my phone, before I get caught up in the whole, because you know, shit just comes at you in life. Yeah. And trust me, when you have the number of employees I have and the number of business ventures I have going on, if I even pull that string, it'll topple me for the day. So yeah. before I even get started, what was I thinking about two hours earlier? What are those things that it's I need to get hard, done? There's so many distractions. There's so many. There's so many. Focused. Yeah. That's where the gamification comes in. You've got to be good at being, I'm not even going to use the word prof productive because productive, you can have 10 things on a post-it or a to-do list. That doesn't mean you're, that you might be productive. That doesn't mean you're effective. Is it, is it kind of I like figured out say, how to be effective. Right. And those core things that I need to do are really larger picture things that move my life forward. So I get in and I work on being effective on my life and my goals for the first couple hours. Once that's yeah. done, then I'll get to email. Then I'll get to the other stuff. Because that stuff's never going to end. Yeah, it's and never, I'll do, never stops. Then I'll do my meetings you don't with get my staff on and email. my managers and yeah. calling you know, different advisors and whatever it is and, and responding to people. So I, I'm, not, I'm not reactive when my day starts. I'm proactive towards being product, not productive, effective. Yeah. So, um, and that's, re that's really my, my key. And then I'll usually do a networking lunch. Um, sometimes it's with a business partner. It could be with, uh, you know, someone else, some other business person in the community, whatever it is. So I try to do, you know, bankers, whatever. So I'll, I'll do a bus business networking lunch. And then the second half of my day, a lot of times I'll dedicate to um, developing other people's businesses. You know, it's a lot of what I do now. So, uh, and then I can get pulled in different directions and then I don't feel guilty. Because then, you know, that time goes quick, You've right? You've already accomplished your core objective. Right. My core objectives are done. So now the rest of it's kind of fun. Because now you feel good about your day, yeah. right? I've knocked it out of the park today. Yeah. I can go on vacation tomorrow. And I did those things that I had to do for the week. So, and what happens is when you do that day in and day out, you'll wake up one day and be like, holy shit, I don't really have any critical tasks <laughs> to do. What's left is the bullshit. Yeah. So literally a lot of times what I have left that's why you're it's on Periscope just, four times a day. That's sometimes. why I'm on Periscope and Instagram. Yeah. I can spend four hours a day yeah. on my social media. <laughs> I'm like, what is he doing right now? Literally by like, 11 o'clock, I'm like, all right, well, well. shit. <laughs> you know, until the next project comes up, you know, I'm meeting with my team, motivating them, managers, making sure the business is on track. I look at a lot of reporting, a lot. I'm a very statistical person. A lot of, a, a lot of reports to have my thumb on what's going on. But I've figured out how to be effective in my day. And that's if I could teach things to entrepreneurs. I mean, that's kind of the most important thing. It's not about to-do lists. It's not about goals. It's about a goal. Uh, One thing. You can't, you can't be pulled in different directions. And when you work day in and day out only towards one thing, not three things, not four things, one thing, how fast you move towards that one goal, I mean, you, you'll go light years when you're day in and day out because it's like inch by inch but you go times you know three years four years you're moving towards that thing fast instead of half inch today towards this goal half inch towards another goal tomorrow i didn't do shit because i wasn't effective yeah. i was working on my to-do list which is really bullshit you know and yeah. and then what happens is you know you're not really being effective at anything 
So, and, and that's what it takes to get off that hamster wheel and really start moving towards what you need to move towards, whatever it is. And it could be, it's not always financial. I mean, it could be, you know, building something. It could be giving back in a certain way. Whatever your goals are, that's the way you need to look at it. It needs to be a singular goal and you need to work um, it being effective towards that goal, not at being productive. Productivity yeah. is for staff, other people. You try to outsource as much as you can. Your time should be spent being effective. I mean, that's that's a perfect example. I mean, even just being, being here, this is something that only I can do. It's like a core competency. Only I can do this interview with you, but we have staff back at the office who are like doing tasks that I don't need to be doing right now. Absolutely. You know? We were talking earlier. Yeah. I asked you, I'm like, do you do the editing? You're like, no, I have, yeah, I have, can do the editing. You know, I have someone else that does that. Yeah, because that's, so, that's not effective. Right. You know? It's not effective use of your time. It sounds like one of your biggest core skill sets is the ability to say no. Like, Absolutely. No. Yeah. Dude, isn't that something? I feel like that's something that in the beginning, especially a beginning entrepreneur, might struggle with because they want to have their hands in things. They want to help. They want to be. When I started, I said yes to everything. Ah. So, and, and let me be honest with you because opportunities aren't coming your way. Yeah. Right. You have to make your own opportunities. So, when you're starting, you have to create, and this is where people, I feel like, can't make the transition because the type of person you need to be at the beginning of your journey is the opposite of the kind of person you need to turn into to maintain oh, and grow. What do you mean? Okay, so when you're starting, I mean, no one wrote me a check for a million dollars. I started with 90 bucks, bro. Right, <laughs> selling, yeah, yeah. Selling pile six by nine speakers. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. You know, and then, you know, and then when I started my business, I got sued by a bunch of manufacturers. JL Audio, whatever, they're like, you know, you're not an authorized <laughs> dealer. You know, they tried to put me out of business. So, I mean, through like, battle after battle i ended up becoming authorized i ended up becoming actually one of the largest sony distributors in on the west coast um but it was battle after battle that i went through and i kept saying yes to every opportunity i you know literally like everything from guerrilla marketing to guerrilla business tactics to grow the business and so you're, you're, you're essentially trying to capitalize on every opportunity no matter how little or how large it doesn't matter yeah because you're just clawing and at some point, you look back and you're like, okay, now I've climbed the tree a little bit. If I keep acting this way, it's actually going to uh, keep me down. It's, it's going to keep me from growing. Yeah. So now, and all of a sudden, as soon as you, you, you get a little bit of movement, everybody wants your time. And now you have to say no. So a lot of time when people say, oh, like, you know, wealthy people are assholes. They're not assholes. They've just learned how to be productive with their time. So they have to say no. So you go from being a yes man to get to that point, to all of a sudden you have to learn how to say no. I, you know, I've realized that over the past probably year when we went from having no following to having hundreds of thousands of people read and follow my stuff and getting in time and having millions of people see that stuff. And I used to feel like when I would talk to a social influencer or comment on a blog and they wouldn't get back to me, I'd be like, what is this fucking asshole? He thinks he's better than me. He doesn't want to respond to me. I wrote him an email. He said nothing. And now I'm in, I'm in the opposite uh, the opposite, and we talked about this on an earlier podcast. I'm in the opposite shoes where I'm thinking, I wish I could respond to everyone, but if I do, that's all I'd be doing all day. Right. Not effective. I mean, I set aside, Sounds cold, I set but... aside a certain amount of time a week and I try to get back. I mean, I can't respond to everybody yeah. either, but I try, but I do set some time aside to try to get as much yeah, and you interaction as possible. Because that's why I initially started my social media. I didn't start it because. I wanted to be a YouTube star or whatever. I mean, I don't know what. I want to, be a, why, I want to be a celebrity. I don't know why people start their stuff. I yeah. mean, I just wanted to get my message out there, and the fact that I mean, you have fun. People with it. actually you're having fun. I I do have fun with yeah. it. I do. Um, you know, but it's not as lighthearted as it used to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is something that I was talking actually last night with with King Bach. You know, he's, oh, he's like the Vine. He's the Vine guru. He has 14 million followers. On a Vine? I don't even understand Vine. You know, I so I, uh, these six second things. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, who yeah. Knows. But anyways, uh, the thing is that like when you're doing it for fun and all of a sudden you have followers and, and then like there's a little bit of responsibility like right, right? Right, right so i'm not as um i don't have as much variation i guess you could say as i used to have yeah on my you know instagram not as laid least. back right i'm not as laid back as well, I it's more it's, it, it, it's intentional because a part of the message is really what took off and made my instagram grow grow so i know that you know essentially now i'm curating for them rather than for myself right where before right. it was for myself I'm so it's like, like oh, less pictures fun. of the kids more like serious content. yeah it was never really a lot of pictures about me and that's one thing about i guess my instagram if you compare me to like maybe other influencers and i and um and i follow you but i haven't looked at your overall because i follow so many people i haven't looked yeah. at your, like what your all your tiles look like but if you look at mine i probably only have 10 or 15 percent of the pictures that have me or something about the same or my kids or whatever yeah. so it's not really about me so it's more about my message 
where a lot of people, it's all about them, you know? Yeah. So for me, it's really, you know, and I don't want me to get in the way of my message. And my message is, is essentially mindset, uh, mindset motivation and how you need to think to be successful because they don't teach that stuff in school. Yeah. They just don't. The thought process of how you got to look at money, how you got to look at being successful isn't taught. Critical thinking in general isn't taught in school. Yeah, critical thinking isn't yeah. taught, but to the extent that it is taught, it's not taught in a very practical way. Yeah. Like when I talk, I, I talked at a MBA school last month and I was talking to the students and about two hours in, like people are like, you know, we're in 150 grand in debt to get to this point yeah. and you've taught us more practical things in two hours than we've learned in two years. That's, and scary. It's That's scary. It is scary. That's I was like in shock when I, and like everybody's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm just like, wow, you know, because unfortunately you're taught in theories and then the people teaching you generally are not um they're professional teachers yeah you have you have you so have, you're you're not getting that practical exactly. realistic advice a lot of them don't even have businesses you know most of them don't most of them don't that's that's scary i remember my economics teacher in college owned a bunch of cinnabons <laughs> and he owned like four cinnabons and i thought he was god that's you know, then, pretty cool and yeah. then you know later on in life i you know i mean this is back in the 90s so i looked it up and like you know, you could own, you know, Cinnabon franchises were like 35 grand at the time, you know, so he owned four of these things. And I thought he was like the God of economics, you know, like, you know, you know, and it's just, you know, but that's, you know, the reality is, you know, um, you know, those are the people rightfully so who are, who have a passion for teaching that are teaching, but the students aren't exposed to really the practical stuff that it takes to like be successful, get ahead in life. Like, what does that take? You know, it's interesting that I, I saw, and you talked about this kind of as you're going through your story and a lot of people. I talked to a lot of people about this now, and I try to reiterate the conversation we had in the car in Vegas. But they talked. I'm trying to talk to them about about selling a business. And I don't have as much experience with that as you do. You've sold multiple businesses. Yeah. How, like, how do you? How do you? When you build something, do you know you're going to sell it? And so you no. build it intentionally to sell when it. When I or? buy a business or build a business, and I've sold probably a dozen businesses, the intention is never from the beginning to sell the business. However, you have to build the business to sell it systems right yeah. so it comes a lot of it comes down to systems so you need to implement best practices and you got to run the books the accounting the workflow in ways that can be documented and the processes are documented so if and so this comes in this this actually comes into two scenarios if god forbid i did want to sell it everything is so set up so good that a monkey can run it, essentially. Yeah, you know, I, don't just, just, I didn't want to say that, but yeah, yeah, essentially a monkey can do it, you know? Yeah. So that's one thing. Now, what does that achieve? For me, what it achieves is a life of freedom. So for, for, for my own selfish purposes, setting it up that way allows me freedom to travel and not be as ingrained in the business. Because what happens is most entrepreneurs create a glorified job for themselves. Uh, They're not really yeah, creating yeah, a business. Yeah, yeah. They're creating a job create work for themselves work and i've had you know and before i figured all this stuff at one point i had 40 employees that were literally spinning around me is that the law firm? and i was yeah when i had yeah. my law firm like so it was it was me and i had attorneys staff paralegals and it all sounds like a nightmare the honestly. world revolves that around me horrible. it was a nightmare i made a lot of money doing it however it was the worst experience of my life and I said, you know, there has to be a better way. You have to have the right systems in place. And maybe do you make a little bit less money? Yeah, because now you're adding maybe layers of things that take time management and, and management. But um, but really now my goal when I look at scaling a business is it's essentially built in a way that I don't even touch it. I'm more or less an advisor. So I play like an advisory role. Kind of like a Toby Myers. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So I'm just I'm on I'm on the periphery. And I'm just, you know, making sure it's heading in the right direction. Uh, you know, I provide resources if it needs it. I provide, you know, I do a lot of forecasting and uh, a lot of making sure the right people are in the organization. But beyond that, I am not actively operating, managing, or doing anything. Yeah. So that's just not um, who, at least who I've transitioned into. Do you think that like in the beginning, there's some sort of ego component with wanting to control things? Absolutely. I think yeah. what happens is you get into it and the more employees you have that answer to you and the more revenues you, you do and you feel like, oh, this is me, this is me. People think they're way more important than they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've realized that I'm not shit. Like at the end of the day, like, you know. Most of the things that need to get done, someone can do better than you. Absolutely. You know. There's only, you have like core competencies and the things that you're good. And I kind of, when you're talking about overseeing the direction, I kind of think about the analogy of 
of having a ship and steering it one degree, making it miles off course or on course. Right. If you have enough vision where you can stand at the 40,000 foot view and see what needs to get done and just make little tweaks. So you make, you make a good point because the businesses I've been able to scale to massive size have been the ones that I haven't been the day-to-day operator. Uh, and the reason is when you're the day-to-day operator, you can't, you can't handle micro and macro. Your right. brain just does not allow it because you see all these obstacles. I have an obstacle. I don't have the right talent. I don't have enough money. I don't have the right resources. I don't have this. I don't, I don't, I don't. So you're creating these walls that keep you from really looking at how to scale the business and grow it. So in order to really scale and grow a business, and that's, that's a lot of times what happens. And the reason uh, you see a lot of founders being pushed out of companies when they hit a particular size is they have the same mentality. So they're the, they're the, they were essentially the founding, owning operator, and they're not looking at the business the way the investors want him to look at the business. So they kick him out and they bring in a CEO yeah. that's a scaler, yeah. that's, a, that's a high altitude looking down, like this is strategic planning now. It's not operating anymore. So, um, and that transition is really hard for a lot of people. It was hard for me. I mean, it took me, even though I made a lot of money selling a lot of businesses, but I sold them to other people that had to like then fulfill my role, which the business revolved around me, yeah. you know, so I sold it, let's say to you. And now the bills business revolves around you, you know, and, and they weren't, and those are the type of businesses that they were. Yeah. So how do you find that? Like, do you find that, um, businesses where there is like a central person, central component, uh, there's a, a, a cap that they hit where they just can't get any bigger because there's that one piece is always the bottleneck. Yeah, it, yeah. it does. I, you know, I, I wouldn't say they can't get any bigger cause they could still get pretty large, but it, there is a bottleneck problem. And, and it is the most difficult thing in life is to give up control. Yeah. It doesn't matter if it's business, your kids, you know, your wife or whatever it is, right? In life, to, to, to live a type of life where you're like, it's okay if I don't have control. It's okay if I don't know what's going to happen next. People are not okay with that. Yeah. You know? So, and I think it's, it's magnified when it's your business. It's your baby. I mean, you spend, you know, 12 hours a day, you're living, breathing it. It's really difficult for people to be like, it's okay if my employee makes this decision and he fucks it up. They can't accept that. So in my mind, my most valuable employees are the ones that made the most mistakes because they know what works, what doesn't work. So why the fuck would I fire them? Yeah. That person, now I got millions invested in them. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to yeah. fire them. Yeah. They're my most valuable you know, employees. You know? So it's just switching that mindset to think that way is just people have real difficulty. That's, something, that's a transition I've made mentally. Uh, just even in the past year, transitioning from just being like kind of like a hustler, kind of moving as fast as I could by myself to now hiring people. We, now we have an office space. And I always used to think like, okay, you know, I, I built this business so I have freedom and I, I don't want to have to specific work hours and times and structures. And I'm like, well, we actually need work hours yeah. because otherwise no one knows when they're supposed to be accountable. There's no like structures and systems in place to make sure things get done. Absolutely. You know, and so my mindset's changing a little bit and I'm realizing that some of the things were I looked back on in the past when I had a job and I'm like, Oh, I hate why my manager or my boss said that I'm realizing, Oh, now you're doing it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, like yeah. one of my, um, one of my employees who's amazing came to me with a, with a great idea for a project. And I had to be like, we can't do this. Cause I'm looking, we don't, we can't do this in the next quarter. We don't have enough time. It's going to cost too much. We'll probably lose money on it, which could be fine. But right now we need a, like a bigger idea. We can't do this. And, um, and I, that's something that maybe in, in the past years ago, I would have been like, Oh, they don't see my, they don't see the vision. Right. But now moving from, hustler mentality as CEO, I realize, okay, it's not about me. It's about the business. If I want the business to survive, I have to say no to this project right now because we can't support it. Yeah. You know, I mean, one thing I always tell my own staff is, you know, first, always put the business first, not me. Yeah. Don't put me ahead of the business. If you always make decisions that are best for the organization, then the organization will be healthy. And I can't ever judge you on that. I can't, you'll never get fired for making that type of a decision. Yeah. And so you always got to put the organization first. And even myself, I look at not only myself, but my businesses from a very, I don't judge myself. And I look at myself from a very third person perspective. So it's non-emotional and you always have to make stoic stoic. You do. <laughs> so you have to make business, you have to make business decisions that are best for the business. And they might not always be best for the business owner. Ah, so, whoa. and that's what do you, so what do you, what's an example of that? What do you mean? There's a lot of examples, but I mean, it could be, you know, I, you know, it generally goes one of two ways. One is financial decisions. Sometimes what's financial, the best financial decision for the business, a lot of times not the best financial decision for the right. shareholders. Right. And then the second one would be um, a lot of hiring. You know, there are people that are complete assholes, but they're good for my business. <laughs> and, you know, and 
the old unsophisticated me would be, you know, screw them. I don't need them. Get them out. Right. Right. But the new me is like, you might be an asshole, but I love you. You're a good part of my team. You really got the job done. You know, yeah. and uh, and you can't be afraid of those type of people. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, the immature business person is afraid of those type of people. They're afraid of anybody who challenges their power. But there's so many things about that. for me is I want to be surrounded with a bunch of people that want my job. They want to challenge my power. And that and, and I've learned to operate in that landscape where before this person's a threat, they're out. Yeah. You know? So yeah. Uh, that's, that's, that's really counterintuitive. That's not. That's not a normal that's way of normal thinking, way of but thinking. you know, and, but the thing is I've had good mentors and I didn't come up with half this shit. You know, I, you know, I've made a lot of mistakes, you know, beyond making the mistakes, I've had good people around me that have showed me kind of how they take their business to the next level, Yeah. you know, and, and how, and how their mentors took their, you know, that business to the next level. So as you keep kind of seeing you're exposed to higher and higher levels, I think, you know, if you're smart, you allow it to change the way you think. Yeah, I mean, I think that one of the the most interesting, surprising parts of um, going to business is how, kind of like you were mentioning earlier, you can't be the same person at the at the middle or end of your journey that you were at the beginning. And it's surprising because you you feel like, at least for me, I felt like when I was starting this and I was, it, it was in the beginning, it was just a blog. Now it's a platform and there's a podcast and there's videos and we're doing speeches and stuff like that. That's cool. In the beginning, it was just me kind of blowing off steam and talking to people about my frustrations. And now it's, it's not about me. It's about, um, it's about a bigger vision. And sometimes I have to really take a step back and think, okay, if the goal is to inspire people and to create, uh, services that help people and to expand my voice, then how, how can I do that without making everything, um, a personal victory? Like what can I do to help a lot of people? Even if it's like, if even, even if it's not the best move for me, you right. know, which is not always easy. Right. Yeah. What's your end goal? I'm going to quiz you a little bit. End goal? Well, we, we have a book we're writing. I'm How old are you? Right now. 27. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so where do you want to be when you're 37? When I'm, you want to be your age? Yeah. When you're getting old. <laughs> um, my, my end goal, one of my, one of my biggest goals is I want to do commercial real estate investment. Okay. Right. So I want to, uh, I want to, want to build a real estate empire. Yeah. Right. It's fun. It's fun. Yeah. I like it. it is. I love it. I love it. Um, I have, uh, five deals in escrow right now worth about 13 14 million bucks so yeah come come shadow me one day i'll show you i'll show you what the commercial the commercial side's actually tougher than residential but um fine but it's uh it's 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 a good challenge so one of, one of my this is my philosophy and i'm not sure if it's the correct way of thinking but my philosophy is look i have a good business going now grow it expand it and then transition into something else once i have the, the resources to do that so you're focusing on creating a brand and then around the brand creating the infrastructure or are you just going to milk the brand and then make the transition? No, I'll create the infrastructure. I mean, I think the the brand will always be useful. Like, which way something will be a book. It will expand into media. We'll eventually start doing TV. So why did you pick something that's not your name? Well, it's already been picked now. But uh, right. I mean, I think I think I want to be able to not always be the focus of the of the brand. I think that the brand is bigger than me, and so I use my face a lot now because people know that. But soon there will be other people who share my vision but aren't necessarily me. Right. You can represent some of these ideas. Right. It's, I think it's better that so way. So when in three years you're gonna change it to rich thirty something? <laughs> uh no, a twenty something is a mentality. You have the mentality. I know. You know. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a mentality. Yeah, it is. You'll, you'll it really is. You'll, you'll cling on to the mentality as long as you can. But, but what it is it's, it's it's the mentality to do whatever it takes. It's that period between for you eighteen and twenty six where you're grinding. Absolutely, man. If you're still waking up and you're not and you have the hungry mentality, that's timeless. Yeah. My wife yes actually this morning I was on Bluetooth driving in talking to her and she's like because uh, I got in late last night because of you know I live in Orange County it's about an hour south from here and I was at USC same as we battled a couple hours of traffic to get there and then you know the event went on and I didn't leave I think till about 10 o'clock by the time I got home it was like 10 50 11 o'clock so I didn't really get to talk to her and she left early to take the kids to school because they live they go to school far away from where we live I was in the shower making it more difficult on yourself I know so anyways she's like you know why you know why do you do this? You're not getting paid to do it. Yeah, like, like, yeah. why are you giving your time? I go, you know, being around people that are in their late teens, early twenties and watching the type of ideas that are coming out of them and how their thinking process is and being exposed to that is worth so much to me in my business that I, it's hard to articulate, you know, that energy and, and being able to see around the curve, right? When you're, when you're judging essentially what college students believe is a good viable business and they're pitching you for investment, it's, uh, you know, you're, you're essentially seeing what the future is. 
because there's generally a common threat thread in a lot of this stuff. You'll start seeing patterns. And you're like, hey, this is how they're thinking. This is where the future is going. Not only, not only and now I could apply yeah. some of that to my business to be ready for it. I could, in some opportunistic way, take yeah. advantage of it and uh, be, but more be prepared for it and and to be able to kind of have some sort of a, I guess, a line into that system where like you could kind of see that. To me, that's worth. I mean. It's worth more than anything that anybody could pay me. I'd do it for free forever, yeah. you know? So so uh, I do agree with you. Rich 20-something is, the, you know, the 20-something mentality, 20-something, um, especially our entrepreneur mentality, yeah. is uh, is definitely a mindset. And, you know, it's something you need to keep forever. There's like a, this cultural archetype of being in your 20s and that being a period of, people will say, I, I wish, you know, people say, I wish I could go back to my high school my high school weight and my, I wish I was as fit as I was in my twenties. The twenties is like this golden period. They have stores like forever 21. Like there was this period that you, even if it wasn't that great in your mind, right. especially when you pass, you're like, man, my twenties, those are, that's a really great time. Yeah. You know, that's what the idea is. Yeah. It's I'll be honest, my thirties has been the best. Though. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, you know, you get established, you're you more get, confident you little, and it's yeah. like, and just life becomes easier. I have to, if you figured yeah. yourself out, you know, some people don't figure themselves out till they're much older, but well, I'm, you, you know, know for well, me, I mean, I worked most of my twenties. I didn't, I didn't really even have a twenties. I don't even know what was the like. Do you remember college? I go, no, college uh, no, sucked, man. Are you <laughs> kidding me? I was in six to ten p.m. classes. You know, like this is horrible. I always laugh. People are like, oh, you know, I wish you could be twenty-one again. I'm like, why? I wish you could be eighteen again. Why? Eighteen wasn't that yeah. wasn't that fun for me. No, li <laughs> life starts in your thirties. I think. Yeah, you hear that, guys? Um, I'm curious, and we'll we'll kind of wrap it up. But I'm curious um, to know about how you handle all your responsibilities business wise and still maintain healthy relationships because I think that's really difficult for a lot of entrepreneurs. Right. So I think, you know, being effective at what you do. So you can't get caught up. You can't become reactive. And and it's something that you have to consciously think of. It's it never becomes subconscious. A lot of what I do is based out of good habits, but at the same time, I'm conscious of the fact that if I become reactive in my day, if I say, you know, oh Daniel, you know, I'm gonna get back to you and I don't deal with it right then and there. Now I put something off that's gonna add stress to me and whatever. And and then I'm becoming reactive to this person, that person, this email responding to this person. And you have to learn how to ignore large chunks of data, essentially, that you absorb during the day. And most people can't. Most people think if someone says, let me know, or sends them an email, or leaves them a voicemail, that they have to respond. You don't have to respond. You cannot be you know, reactive in your day. I mean, that's kind of the bottom line. So, so how I create time is by literally ignoring 90% of what happens in the day. And the reality <laughs> is only 10% of it matters. That's yeah. the reality. I mean, let's be real. The rest of it doesn't, who gives a fuck if Joey called and said, hey bro, like, you know, whatever. What's up? You know, what's up? You know, if Joey's a real friend, it's okay if you don't call him back. Yeah, that's true. You know, because you know why? If he really needs you, you'll be there. For I don't him. talk to my best friends for so, four months and I call him, it's normal, right. it's fine. But you know? just, you can't be reactive. <laughs> you cannot be reactive. And that's is that's what it boils down to. That's key. I mean, how do you think, whether you're the president or CEO of a Fortune 500 company, how do they manage organizations with hundreds of thousands of employees yeah, yeah. in the amount of responsibility? And it's not that they have all these amazing managers, that you have to be able to sift through the data that's coming at you and saying, this is essential for me to move my organization forward. This is essential for me to move my life forward. And those are the only things that you act on. Everything else you ignore. And that takes a lot of practice. And it also, beyond the practice, you know, once you master the, the art of it, you always have to be conscious of it. So in the back of my mind, I always make a decision when I do something I, I tell you know my own followers on on Periscope or when I'm talking uh, to you know students, I tell them you have to think in binary terms. What does that mean? It's black and white. It's yes and no. And the the question you ask is, does this bring me closer to my goal? That's the only question I want you to ask. And now we talked earlier. I'm not talking about your three or four goals. Your number one goal in life. Does doing this bring me closer to that goal? And if the answer is no, you don't do it. If the answer is yes, you do it. If the answer is it doesn't bring me closer to the goal, but it can get me fired. Well, you should probably fucking do it. But if it's not going to get you fired and it doesn't bring you closer to your goal, then fucking don't do it. That's so, that's so simple, I look at but it's every, not easy, though. It's, it's not simple, easy. You have to train yourself. Yeah. I look at emails that way. I look at voicemails that way. I look at um, everything. Do you know that when I get voicemails from like other business associates, half the time I delete them? I don't even listen to it. I don't wow. even care what they're fucking saying. They're not essential in my growth and moving my life forward. 
A lot of people and if it's it's that important, they'll hunt me down on the phone. Oh. They'll call my secretary. They'll send me a text message. Right? A lot of people say it's very selfish. It's not about being, it is, you know what? Yeah. It is selfish. Ah. It's selfish so I can make sure the 52 families that work for me have food on the table, my organization's Your moving own forward, and I can feed 10,000 people this Thanksgiving. And I'm sorry, Manny, Mo, and Jack, that I didn't fucking call you back. <laughs> Sue me, you know? But that's the way you need to think. And Matt, that's I can see the way, Matt is smiling. His ears are perking up from inside of his earphones. <laughs> I can see you smiling. No, but that's, but that's the way you need to look at, I think, life in general in order to move quickly ahead in life. Because if you become, this life will suck you up. There's so much data hitting you from every angle. Yeah. And you're going to be reactive. And then you're going to say, fuck, I didn't do what I needed this week. This week turns into this month, this year. Then you're 30 years old. What happened to my 20s? You know, I'm 39. Mean, you know, I'm moving fast, man. I move. I might be old, but but. So is this the mentality I, you know, that you use to make sure that you still have time for your family? Because, absolutely. Because if you can't turn it off, then you'll never have time for them. I am doing it for two reasons. You have this mentality. The biggest, you know, the, the biggest byproduct is creating a lot more time. Yeah. So now, I create a lot more time for two reasons. One is to then be able to have multiple ventures going on instead of one because it's very easy to just you know i could be selling ice cubes and it could be my 24 hour a day job right yeah. you get sucked into it and do that but you create this extra time so now i can have more ventures and then the other side of the coin is i can have the freedom to spend it with my family and travel a lot i travel three four months out of the year you know i was in europe 41 days straight this summer i saw that yeah and right. uh you know and i still ran my businesses i had very large business events that happened while I was gone. I had real estate events, escrows closing and whatever while I was gone and I was handling it all. Um, but I have a format for how I handle things in my life and it's effective. That's the point. I kind of imagine- I care like, less about productivity. Productivity is for my, my receptionist better be productive. Yeah. She better fucking, yeah. Her every time I walk better by, be on point. she better look like she's busy. Yeah. Even if she's not, right? But <laughs> me as the boss, I have to be effective. Yeah. And, and effectiveness is the secret. It's like, it's like, a single cut. That's it. Yeah, you know? single cut. I imagine you being at your, you wake up in the morning in your room, kind of like Minority Report, and you just like move these balls around. You're just like, okay, okay. You know? <laughs> I have I have a three screen set up at the office. Yeah, so, yeah. So I've got two screens set up. Um, <laughs> so I appreciate you for being here, man. It's Thanks for coming. This pleasure. was fun. This was great. Um, if you had to give one takeaway to uh, a struggling entrepreneur who doesn't know how to get from where they are to where they want to be, what would it be? struggling that means they're at the beginning of their journey the beginning yeah well it's always a struggle at the beginning right right beginning yeah, yeah. it's a struggle later on too trust yeah, me yeah, yeah, it doesn't yeah. get any easier the struggles just get you more, just get better they at get it. grander just, and then you get you you rise to the occasion right. but you know i think the biggest thing i i could say to someone is that i always use the pear tree analogy and essentially if you look at a pear tree it takes seven years to bear fruit longer than any any other tree i didn't know that so seven years i know it's, it's longer than any other produce the supermarket pears pears yeah. wow pear trees seven years so you plant it you give it love you prune it you, it takes a lot of water a lot of fertilizer and it goes and goes and most people give up in year one two three just like the pear tree you know they, they pull it out of the ground they sell it yeah. this thing's defective it's not working you know and they give up too early and in my situation i mean i worked i, I can't even explain the hours i was working like it's I'm almost embarrassed to say that I had to work those hours to make the little amount of money that I yeah, made. Yeah, yeah. Like it wasn't even like minimum wage. Like it was embarrassing that I had to work those hours. But when you don't have the knowledge and you don't have the experience or the money, the only thing I could make it up for when I was starting was just hours. I have hours. My time doesn't cost me anything. Yeah. At least that's what you think at the beginning. You know, I have the only thing I have is 24 hours and I'm willing to give all of it, right? To learn. And, and you just got to stick with it because there will be a breakthrough. And the biggest thing I see is people giving up too early. And that's, that's kind of my advice is just, you know, don't give up. It's very cliche, but it doesn't come fast. You have to be patient. And it does take success is one of those things. It does take seven years, does take eight years, does take 10 years. I have businesses now that I start with a five or 10 year horizon. Yeah. So I know I'm not even going to make a dollar for 10 years. And, you know, and that's, because now I have the experience and I realize that like, look, to do this thing right, it's going to take this long. And none of this stuff happens overnight. Unless you inherited your money, none of this, you know, financial success happened overnight. I did it all you know, by myself except for a nice $8 million loan from my dad. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> um, even, even there was a thing on Warren Buffett where he's earned 95% of his net worth. After 50, right? After the age of 50. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, I mean, that's just the Although way Although 5% works. of his net worth is still a lot. So. Yeah, 5% is massive. <laughs> it's massive. But, but still, um, you know, and it just takes time. And I was a very impatient person. And what business has taught me is to become a very patient person. And yeah. the more patient you are, the more competitive edge you're going to have over your competitors and the other people you're dealing with. And, and even though I want to get everything done, you have to have a sense of urgency and I want to get everything done like immediately, but I'm also very patient. Yeah, I'm so glad that you said that. We were talking last podcast about how bamboo trees, you'll plant a, a seed and it won't sprout for 10 years. And you wow. have to keep watering it in that period. But after those 10 years, it can sprout up to 100 feet in the first month. And you, you, have, good you can have an entire forest of bamboo trees that have not grown for 10 years and now grow 100 feet in a month. Right. And uh, I, I'm, I'm happy that you said that because people get annoyed with hearing that shit. Right. But it's important. Look, it took me eight, well, if you count, at 26, I became a millionaire. Um, Fuck, I'm behind. I, it took me eight, eight years. <laughs> but really, I started at 16. Compared, right. you know, I was already right. selling five, 10 grand worth a m- month. Worth. So it took me 10 years for yeah. my first million. Yeah. I became a multimillionaire at 28. So the uh, second one took exponential two growth. years. Exponential growth. And you know, from there to now, it's a different story. But I mean, it's just yeah. one of those things that like, that's what it is. It's that first, like, the first 100 grand you kill yourself for. Yeah. You literally, like I felt <laughs> like I was losing fingernails and I was clawing so hard. <laughs> you know, you kill, and then, but that's how it works. And you just have to be patient. And you, and you know, and you have to make good decisions and people don't make good decisions. You got to live below your means. You know, yeah. I always tell people if it's between the $60 Zara jeans and the $300 true religions, unless you're where you want to be in life, you're wearing those fucking Zaras. When I see these 21 year old kids come pitch me about a business idea and they're looking for $50,000 seed money and I'm looking at them and they're wearing like two grand worth of fucking <laughs> clothes. I'm like, dude. This guy's head's not even in they the right look place. Their best I don't want to. I don't want to invest in this guy. His <laughs> they, head's not even in the right place. You have to make those sacrifices. Yeah. I was making ten grand a month. I was sharing a fourteen hundred dollar apartment, so I could save seven hundred dollars. So I could plow it back into my business, wow. buy more audio equipment, and keep scaling my business. Wow. And that's the kind of shit you got to do. You can't reward yourself until you're close to where you want to be. I have some returns to make. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Steven, I appreciate you, man. Thank you no guys problem. for joining us. Thanks, guys. Thanks podcast. for tuning in. Uh, all Steven stuff will be in the description below. Agent Steven, Periscope, Instagram, website, Twitter, all that stuff. Thank you for joining us. See you next time. <laughs>